Hey, Thea. Hey, Zarian. <laughs> so we decided we want to talk about home birth this, this episode. And it, it follows on uh, a, a friend uh, is coming up to having her third child and is, uh, has decided to do a home birth. And we were talking about it. And given that you had all of your boys at home, your healthy boys at home, and I had both my kids at home, and our mother had our youngest at home, mm -hmm. we have some experience with that and mm -hmm. thought it related to a lot of the other discussions we've had about empowerment, authority, autonomy, self, uh, self responsibility, and more. Um, and that's a, a loud, long train horn. <laughs> it's, yeah. um, you know, it all depends on the personality, I think, of the train driver. Right. It varies. Right. Sometimes it's like, mm. and what kind of day they're having. Yeah. <laughs> um, so just to start out with, with a, a, a couple of thoughts, we'll go from there. Um, a lot of times I'll be in a, a group of women or be talking to women about birth and having had a home birth and those that haven't had that that experience will often say oh how brave you're yeah. so brave wow that guy is really <laughs> aggro <laughs> um and so they'll yeah they'll say oh you're so brave um you know and i always say no uh trust me i i think you're the brave one uh, the, the women who manage to have uncomplicated births mm -hmm. uh, without intervention, according to the plan that they had set forth when they came into the hospital, I, I can't really even imagine having that experience. Yeah. How much harder Truly. it would be to have had uh, a, you know, as gentle a birth as birth can be, right? It, yeah, I mean, as birth is this place of absolute, power and vulnerability at the same at time once. Mm -hmm. at once and uh and to be in a situation that you aren't even really comfortable or quite relaxed oh I, I can't even fathom i mean i mean you're you're in a different i mean any woman who's gone through this knows you're in a different state of mind you if you're, you're allowed to be and i, I yeah, wonder about right. that too i, I mean i think I don't know, I haven't done it in the hospital. And I wonder if it's been, if women who've given birth in hospitals have had varying experiences of being in that altered state yeah. or not, or, yeah. you know. I or if they, if they have to always kind of be on in order to say no or to watch what's going, you know, be just, yeah. I mean, just alone. Um, so, you know, uh, Obviously, complications can happen in any situation, right? But first off, uh, most midwives are incredibly experienced at yeah. delivering babies, actually delivering them, not, not C-sections, but actually delivering them and delivering them in a number of different circumstances. I mean, my, my son, for example, you know, the cord was wrapped around his head. Um, as happens, I think, in like a quarter of births, right? Very frequently, I think, uh -huh. yeah. Um, uh, my my midwife who delivered our daughter helped helped me deliver our daughter um you know had, had delivered she worked in 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 the back countries of amish land right she delivered twins she delivered breech baby she could do anything you know yeah. and it was wonderful to be in the hands of someone so beautifully experienced um no matter what came up and of course midwives they bring the oxygen they have a lot of things at their disposal right here at the house right Yep. And, you know, uh, they, they're, they, they have relationships with doctors at hospitals so that if mm -hmm. you need a transfer, you can go there. Yeah. But provided it goes just the normal course, yeah. you're, you're in your own home, in, you're in your own bed or bathtub or whatever you choose. Mm -hmm. uh, you are able to go at your own pace. You don't have to uh, speed it up or, 
or uh, either say no constantly to Pitocin or finally accept taking Pitocin to stimulate your contractions in order to get things moving because the hospital won't allow you to be there for longer than a couple of days, et cetera, right? Right. So many things. And, and on top of it, just you don't have to uh, worry about somebody coming, you know, people coming in, checking, taking blood, well, all the things, who knows? I mean, I have no idea what it's like because I've not done it except for having watched documentaries on yeah. the difference between those types of births. But, you know, you don't need to be hooked up to machines. You don't, you don't have the constant intrusion of people coming in and out. Um, right. Anymore, right. So it, it just it, facilitates you know, the birth experience. It does. It's as, happening as, healthily and smoothly. <laughs> as, as in, in so many, um, so many pieces of literature about the, the space of birth, liken it to lovemaking in a way too, yeah. because, or anything that requires a space of settling in, relaxing, letting down, opening up. It's yeah. a very intimate experience. And yeah. picturing lovemaking in the hospital, they don't go so well together. <laughs> right. I mean, you know, in right. my mind. Um, so I think that's one picture. And another thing that was sparking in my mind while you were laying out those examples is being a midwife, which is with women, right, is, is with them, um, is much like being a parent, knowing when to intervene and when to stay back and allow the process to simply occur. And yeah. you're frankly allowing that space to be there. We're doing that as parents for our children, sometimes failing, sometimes being right on point. We're doing that as teachers. Any, anything that is a, a guiding post requires that ability to know when to intervene and when to sit back to let the wisdom of the process have its place. Absolutely, absolutely. And that's what gets lost in the hospital, right? Because since we have all these things to check, we do. Yeah. <laughs> so that's one part. Yeah, I, I agreed, agreed. <laughs> Um, I remember even as a child, um, being able to hold my youngest sister in my arms before she was even, you know, washed a hawk and yeah. like insisting on that. I remember insisting that I wanted to, and, um, you know, mom was on the beanbag in our family room, mm -hmm. right? Um, it, it was just... It was, it was an extraordinarily different experience than she had had with her previous three births yeah. with, with me and, our, and uh, our, our other sister. She had had them in one hospital and it had just, you know, just pretty bad experiences uh, being forced to induce, um, yeah. being kept away from her child at length and more. I remember then with you, she tried a different hospital hoping that would be better, not at all. And finally, yeah, you know, went to the the next obvious uh, choice, which was not um, even legal in the state at the time, right? I don't know if it is yet. I, it was yes, right. In, in years where we where we where we grew up, right? Um, so, so back to so I guess what I'd like to do, I think you had articulated this. Maybe you want to say it again about just inverting a. a well, you, you were speaking about, you know, and I've had those conversations with people too, uh, who've said how courageous to do it at home and my feeling quite the same as you that no. And then I was thinking that it's really about taking that image, that um, picture of what birth is and it's become inverted. It's, it's gotten, it's slipped through the wormhole to the other side, you know, the images of what's courageous and what's comforting and safe you know and and i think that there's a lot of movement of that at least in the communities that we live in of people recognizing that birth needs to be re-looked at to be redone yeah. to be safe um and to and, so and to be and to be non-medicalized and to be non-medicalized to to give families the best start you know i think one of the big parts of it being so medicalized is that it it seems to create 
distance when there should be connection right yeah. off the bat, you know, and, and it's hard enough. I, I mean, that's the part that boggles my mind. It's, Me too. it's hard enough, just the actual physical laboring of it. And then really the weeks after of oh the, the care. I mean, it's amazing <laughs> what we do. Well, it's, I mean, and you know, let's go further. It's not just, you know, yes, the actual physical laboring, but it, I've never experienced anything like it. No. Right. And, and having done it, um, because we, we all, most women, I think would agree you get to a point and I guess that that's around transition, but you get to a point where you cannot imagine going further. It's, it is unbearable. Right. And, and it's hard to describe. It's not a pain, like, like a wound. It's the, most unpleasant uh, discomfort I've ever had, right? <laughs> it's like, it's like it, it, that, that goes beyond pain, but it's not sharp pain. It's like- I would even call it more, I mean, and we all have our different colorings of it. And I think that go, that's such an interesting idea we've talked about even in another conversation about what we identify as pain and how we articulate it and how we hold it in our understanding. Right. Um, but it's more like unbelievable. Yeah, it's, it's, it's un going it's into unbelievable. a space that is unbelievable. Yes, and yes. Is, and, and there is a complete, there is required a complete surrender into yes. what is unbelievable. Yes, yes. And, 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 and the courage. I mean, <laughs> and I, um, I remember saying your first birth. <laughs> I well, remember it too. Well, the first birth you remember because as and I'll say to the viewer, this is after Thea's third birth, third home birth, and she has her youngest in a sling, <laughs> having been born seven weeks before. And she's there in my <laughs> little apartment, you know, helping me along. And me time. <laughs> me in yeah. my heady way uh and crazy trippy way that birth sends you into not realizing that I was as close as I was just somehow thinking that I it was just getting I was just getting uh, more more pathetically weak <laughs> and unable to to deal with it and um uh and and I remember you just marveling that I was uh still talking right about it instead of just going into myself right and then then the second time um, Thea got there 15 minutes after oh. the delivery of my daughter. Um, and I remember at the point where it was just in where, where my midwife was saying she's, because of course the midwives are, um, they're checking all the time. They're monitoring the heart rate of the baby, yours, everything. Right. And intimately, you know, and, and, and frequently they're right there. And she said, okay, you know, if, if, if they don't come out, we weren't sure, boy or girl, they don't come out, um, you know, in the next, next one or st doesn't start coming out, we're going to have you change your position. And in that moment, and she told me why, because her heart rate was, was not, um, not coming up as quickly as it should. Right. And I remember thinking, okay. And, I, and all I could think of was... <laughs> that scene from Braveheart <laughs> where Mel Gibson's character is be, being disemboweled and, <laughs> and, he, and he shouts freedom. And I think to myself, if, cause it's based, it's a historical, um, uh, you know, it's based on a true story. I thought to myself, if somebody could do that and shout freedom, I can do this and I can get her out. Wow. And I did, right? So it's like, we all go through all these different problems. <laughs> but, but doing that, yeah. And doing that, or, or as we were talking about earlier, um, knowing very deep down that something has to be, you, you, you're in touch with what's going on there with your child. Mm -hmm. And I've heard so many stories from so many women who have said, where, where, whether it's the doctor or the midwife or anybody saying, no, you know, you're not far, you know, or, or you've still got a while. And the woman is just like, no, I know. 
they need to come out and not only do they need to come out, I need to transfer because they need to come out now. And uh -huh. the mother gets in touch with an instinct in her that ha she's never had before. Right. Um, that, that puts her authority over her child above all else. Right. Yeah. And, and, and home birth in, in my experience and mind really allows that to happen. Yeah. Um, in a, in a, in a much more <clears throat> conducive way, I guess. Yeah. Pardon me. Uh, then, then the hospital medicalized births. So, yeah. And, different, um, total different framework. <clears throat> Yeah. Here, can we pause for one quick second? Yeah. As I get a drink of water so I don't hack all over the place. Hold on. Yeah. Okay. So we just got on, off on a tangent, but I want to point out a couple of things to folks who are looking at this and are interested in the idea of home birth, but are concerned about the risks. Um, so a, this came out this last year or so. Um, a study by researchers at Johns Hopkins Medicine says medical errors should rank as the third leading cause of death in the United States. Um, wow. You know, and that's, I'm sh I have a feeling it's probably even higher, you know, because that's really what's, what's attributed to medical errors. Mm -hmm. And our experience, uh, you know, extensive experience in the hospitals taking care of our parents, um, suggests to me that there are a lot of things or a lot of dots that are not connected uh, where intervention causes more complications right. that lead to, to death as well. And, in, and unnecessary mm. interventions or and even mis and ill communicated yeah. interventions. You know, uh, so much of it I think is like the whole system so big that the communication yeah. channels are not connected and cohesive and things yeah get Fall missed through the cracks. or whatever. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's, yeah. it's, it's become quite dehumanized, you know, and yeah. you don't want to really bring, bring a child into such a dehumanized system to give them a good start, you know? Right. Um, and it's not to say that there aren't some hospitals with some really great teams and great departments, um, Absolutely. you know, that really, you know, and, and I know there's a, a re, there's a, a, movement to revamp that too and to give women more options of even like water births and hospitals and yeah. try to create a, an environment that's a little closer to a birth center so i know that's that consciousness is there yeah but you could also just do it at home you know right um right. so the and then the, here's another uh i think this was like harvard medical review i don't have it printed out where it's where it is, but um, rising U.S. maternal mortality rate demands action from employers. And it goes in to say, the U.S. maternal, maternal mortality rate has more than doubled from 10.3 per 100,000 live births in 1991 to 23.8 in 2014. Over 700 women a year die of complications related to pregnancy each year in the United States, and two thirds of those deaths are preventable. 50,000 women suffer from life-threatening complications of pregnancy. A report from the Commonwealth Fund released in December found American women have the greatest risk of dying from pregnancy complications among 11 high-income countries. Wow. Um, and then another one, uh, I think this was CBS News. Um, yeah. And I think this is, let's see. This was 2013 story, but U.S. has highest first day infant mortality out of industrial, in, out of industrialized world group reports. Um, about 11,300 newborns die within 24 hours of their birth in the U.S. each year. 50% 50, 50 more first day deaths than all other industrialized countries combined. Wow. Right? I mean... So, you know, the, the other thing I want to uh, bring up, and I don't have all, all the data in front of me, but if you really, if you look into the history of midwifery and then 
the involvement of uh, the, 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 the movement toward um, surgeons. Medicalized getting involved, surgeons, yeah. Yeah, getting involved in birth. I mean, because for, for you know, since time immemorial, really, uh, women have been... Uh, in, in the carriers of birth, the, yeah. the holders. The midwives yeah. have always been women, and so really the last couple hundred years, yeah. I I imagine. I mean, it seemed like an easy gig, right? And you know, and there also there's good intention behind it too, because there were complications, and there were complications for lots of reasons that don't actually apply anymore. Right. Where where sanitation. Uh, say that again. Sanitation, cleanliness, poverty. Well, absolutely. Uh, not to mention, okay, well, then, then let's get into this. So uh, I, I, there, there's, it's like a little known tidbit uh, that should be discussed a lot more um, in, in our history books when we're yeah. looking at childbirth, um, infant mortality, uh, infectious disease, and more. Yeah. Um, but there was a, an epidemic of corporal fever, uh, 1700s and on through, through the 1800s and the advent and during the uh, real um, explosion of the Industrialized Revolution, where surgeons were not washing their hands. And there was this, you know, it was like a progressive idea that washing hands is is helpful <laughs> in 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 the medical field. Um, there seemed to be a resistance to washing one's hands, and so you would have the the doctors, the surgeons, leaving the corpse and death, and going straight over to deliver babies, and that resulted in this huge epidemic of maternal mortality. Uh, it, was, it was this epidemic of corporal fever. And that really didn't start changing on an institutionalized level until the 40s, 19, the 1940s, where that became implemented as a rule that you have to wash your hands before giving, you know, helping deliver a baby. So, it's the implications of that are staggering and yeah. and it's it's its own conversation or book really where you have to consider how that impacted the society the societal fabric you had oof, hundreds of thousands of women dying in childbirth so you had the staggering number of orphans yeah resulting from that right around the time of the industrial revolution which led to, you know, families without mothers, um, child labor, uh, the misery of a time. I mean, oh the, my God. The, I mean, when the women are on a round to manage things on a whole the widespread level. Yeah. That's you know? amazing. So, so you Oof. had that and, and, and what was the other thing we were talking about? Um, we're just talking about like even just the um, the birth practices of um, you know the earlier part of last century. I mean, twilight, chloroform, right. forceps, forceps, and all of those interventions. Vacuum. They 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 look at that now and they realize how many deaths and complications that caused. Right. Right. So, I think that if anyone is remotely interested in the empowering and healthy experience of delivering your child at home, I would recommend, you know, a cursory examination of the real history of that and why we have uh, gotten uh, so afraid of yeah. childbirth's dangers yeah. and what those dangers really are now and um, and how those factors can be controlled or what of those factors even apply anymore. Right. And, and what it would mean really in a vast way if, if as large portions of our communities started to really bring it back to the home space, what would that do to our communities in abroad and 
far seeing line? What, what ways would that change our initial bonding with our children and therefore our relationship and dynamics of parenting? And then there, I mean, the, the relationship aspect goes on and on and on and trickles. If we can minimize those pivotal intrinsic to who we become and what we work with traumas as we come into the world, you know, because we all have our traumas to work through. Yeah. And yeah. if in this basic deep realm of entering the earth, if there's love and warmth and safety filling us and feeding us as the parent and as the baby coming in, what would that do to our world? Absolutely. As opposed to the fear and tension and separation and, we experience. And, 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 and traumas. I mean, I mean, just the, the, the interventions, uh, the interventions that are practiced as, as routine in our, in the U S yeah. uh, in, in birth, uh, practices, um, is, is traumatic. It's and, traumatic. And on, on a first, on first day of life, second day of life, you know, if, if, if just imagine what it could be like for a human being to enter this realm. Yeah. In, 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 in enter and be laying there in, in one's mother's arms in the warm and dimly lit room. Quiet. Quiet, surrounded only by loving family and friends. Reverent. And lo lo loving midwives. Yes. Um, because by the way, for anyone also wondering, the midwife always brings an assist, another midwife. They assist each other. There's always two of them. I mean, and, and yet what a difference would that make to yeah. our world if that's how we all came into the world, right? Yep. So, so think about that. You know, we're, we're up on time. Yeah. I mean, maybe, this, maybe we'll talk so more many, about this. So many angles and, and colorings of this dialogue that really play out into all of the things we think about really <laughs> it reverberates <laughs> it's it's, yeah. it's it reverberates right yeah. so so yeah so if you hey so you want to give you give your child the right start <laughs> let's, let's start at birth let's start yeah at birth. let's start at birth thanks okay great talk to you later <laughs> see you later okay let me end this again